Oi! Hello. Joining us today is Peter Bookvar, Chief Investment Officer of Bleakley Advisor Group. I'll introduce him by saying he is uh, as close to on Wall Street as being a brother from a different mother for me. Uh, we've gotten to know each other very well over the years. Uh, the work that we started to do together was done very much covertly. Uh, you fed uh, a lot of the intelligence that went into the market briefings that I prepared for Richard Fisher when, uh, when I was his advisor working at the Dallas Fed. And I'd like, if you could, to take us to the culmination of that relationship of being an indirect advisor to Richard and, uh, and how it ended up in a bar, the King Cole Bar, on a cold night. It was you and me, Arthur Cashin, Howard Silverblatt of Standard & Poor's, uh, and of course, Richard Fisher. Richard came to love your work after you made a particular outlook for the year and used the term beer goggles. So uh, it was interesting, the Wall Street Journal did a retrospective on all of his speeches, and the number one most popular one that he ever made was your beer goggles reference. So take us back to that night and what it was like to meet Richard in person finally after having been such a critical part of his understanding of markets intelligence all those years. Well, what was special for me that night was actually getting to meet him for the first time in person. Mm -hmm. uh, previous to that, through you and, and directly you know, the occasional email correspondence, mm -hmm. uh, the speech where he gave the shout out to me was, was special. And you know, the, the good thing is that we all had a, a similar viewpoint of, of the, the, the way of the world and monetary policy and how it interacted with the regular economy. And, sort of saw things a little different than the conventional thought process in, in Washington. So to actually get to meet him in person was, was pretty special, just as he was walking out the door and, and, and going off to his, to his next thing. Uh, but one thing that did come out of that was also a continued correspondence. I don't think I've seen him since, right. but you know, the occasional email back and forth is, is, is always uh, special to me. Well, I know Richard uh, continues to enjoy your work. Um, it's, how, it's how I start my day as well. I think a lot of us do. Um, but take us back for just a second. What are beer goggles? So back in the day in college, when you would have a little too much to drink, everything uh -huh. looked good. Right. Everything looked better than it might have without the beer. Right. So the analogy was when the Fed is uh, in conducting extreme monetary policy via zero rates for seven years and multiple rounds of QE, it puts beer goggles on investors. Mm -hmm. It makes that sort of awkward, lame investment all of a sudden look like roses. Right. It looks, it looks at that money losing company. Mm -hmm. Well, if we do a little bit of this and that, we can give them some money, everything will turn up roses. Sure. So that was the sort of the analogy that investors become much less uh, focused on the risk when they have those beer goggles on, there's monetary beer goggles on, and only focus on uh, where's my upside. So I guess the, the CLOs all look better at closing time. So <laughs> exactly, yes, yes, good. Before we go to where we are today and collateralize loan obligations, tell us how you think the Fed kind of got the idea in its head how policymakers decided that they had to go to the zero bound before they could launch conventional, uh, unconventional monetary policy, quantitative easing. There are examples that Chair Powell uses, uh, as well as Vice Chair Rich Clarida. They reference back to the episodes in 1995 and 1998 when the Fed was able to execute three rate cuts and then gracefully extract itself from the markets and the economic expansion and the rally in risky assets continued undisturbed. Are we there today? Can he do this? What differentiates 95 and 98 from where we are now? So the important thing about understanding 95 is looking at what happened in 94. Mm -hmm. And that's when Alan Greenspan raised, I think, the Fed funds rate from 3 to 6%. 300 basis points in, in within a year is obviously a rather sharp increase. And there were negative side effects from that. The Orange County Pension Fund, I think, yeah. blew themselves up. The tequila crisis in Mexico. And, and that as well. So going into 95, 
by cutting rates 75 basis points after you just raised 300 the year prior. Mm -hmm. And also you were only four years into an economic expansion right. very early on. That was something that they were able to engineer. And then you fast forward to 98 and we had the long-term capital management blow up. You had the, the Russian debt crisis. Right. Where that was, you know, coming together and a sharp decline in the stock market, the, the Fed was more responding to a decline in markets and a freeze up in markets rather than an actual deterioration in economic growth. But First time was, Alan Greenspan ever did that? Well, exactly. <laughs> so that's how we became trained that on a market hiccup, mm -hmm. as opposed to an economic hiccup, the Fed was going to come and cut interest rates. Right. But we know in late 98, that sowed the seeds for the greatest stock market bubble in history. Right. So saying that 95 and 98 are good reference points for, for us as, a, as the Fed, I think is, is really not thinking through what went on during those two timeframes. Certainly. I mean, the, the years that followed 98 were some of the most, uh, Alan Greenspan had already said, irrational exuberance in December of 1996. Right. So we kind of knew that the train had already left the station, and but... Animal spirits are what animal spirits are. Let's jump forward in time a little bit because Alan Greenspan uh, and you would agree on something. Uh, when he was still chairman at the Fed, he insisted against the protests of Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen, he insisted that the ideal inflation rate was 0%. What say you? So I agree, because that's actual price stability. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you think about zero, let's just take that. That means some things are going up 4%, some things are going down 4%, this price is going up, that price is going down. But in a net way, prices are stable. Right. Now we take technology, for example, it's a pretty safe bet that since the history of time, the price of, of any technological good, whether it was a car in the early 1900s, or it's a computer, or it's a phone, whatever, that those prices eventually you know, continuously go down. Sure. Then there are gonna be some things where prices go up, mostly on the services side, whether it's housing or medical care or tuition mm -hmm. or whatever. But if you can net out that at being around zero, that's actually price stability. It, keep, it, makes, it makes your currency stable, it makes decision-making um, much, much easier Right. And now, if you get into too much debt and you sell a commodity product and the price of that product goes down, well, then you're going to run into trouble. But maybe knowing that, knowing that you don't have pricing power, maybe you don't go into too much debt to begin with. Now, there's a novel thought. Exactly. Now, look at, now getting back to the technology companies, look how successful Silicon Valley has become when they're selling a product that goes down in price every single year. Mm -hmm. So deflation actually has been a benefit to them because it has expanded the market at which they can sell their products. And I like to give the analogy. So an IBM PC in 1981, which retailed for about $3,000, mm -hmm. if you raise that price 2% a year to today, it's costing you $6,000 for the same exact machine. Technology, everything. Right. So now you can go into a Best Buy and you can buy a laptop for under $1,000 instead. But somehow, technology companies found a way to make money when the price of the product goes down. So when you say, let's get 2% annual increase, that means, in theory, that everything has to go up 2%. Now, that's obviously not the case, right. but that's what they're saying. But the reason why they want 2% is not because they model that out as being good for the economy or good for businesses or good for the consumer. They do it for selfish reasons. They do it because if the inflation rate is at 2%, they assume that the Fed funds rate is a certain level above that. If it's a certain level above that, let's just call it 3 4%, which historically the spread was about 200 basis points, sure. that in the next economic downturn, they would have ammunition to cut rates. Cushion. A cushion. But if inflation was zero, well, that would imply a very low Fed funds rate, and that would imply very little ammunition to deal with any economic downturn. So that 2% target is a central bank self-interest target rather than what is economically good for the rest of us. Okay. So uh, the minute Alan Greenspan walked out the door, Ben Bernanke managed to push through his 2% inflation target. 
How do you think that has changed, not just monetary policy here in the United States, but worldwide? You've written extensively, extensively about the Bank of Japan, which still has the 2% target, even though I, you can tell me you've got the history in your mind. I know you do. When the last time they hit 1% was. Right. The only time they actually even hit 2 was only after the, the VAT increase. Mm -hmm. So it was the tax increase that resulted in higher prices. Right. But Higher inflation is a tax anyway. So whether it's a government-administered hike in the value-added tax, mm -hmm. or it's a central bank-generated increase in the overall price scheme by 2%, it's the same thing. Right. So it still does the same sort of damage to a consumer. So I think the 2% was, was just in their minds, their, their, their desire to anchor policy around something. But in their models, while these are very sophisticated models with a lot of PhDs around it, there's a lot of simplistic thinking behind it. It's low rates are good, high rates not so good. Well, if low rates are good, even lower rates are even better. Mm -hmm. And if you print money, and Bernanke gave the helicopter speech in the early 2000s, right. you print money, well, then you can create inflation regardless. Because of the history of the Weimar Republic and Venezuela and Zimbabwe, you print a lot of money, you get inflation. But there was sort of a catch to that, at least with the Fed's experience in um, since 08, was, well, you can print all this money, but if it actually ends up back at the Fed in reserves, it's not really out there. Mm -hmm. It's sort of just landlocked back at the Fed. Japan realized, well, yeah, you can create all this money, but if it doesn't change consumer behavior and it doesn't incentivize businesses to borrow and take advantage of low interest rates, right. well, then there's no inflation to be had. It's the classic paradox of thrift. Exactly. And now we're at a point where monetary policy, I argue, is actually restrictive monetary policy, particularly in Europe and Japan, mm -hmm. rather than being easing because of what it's done to the profitability of their banking systems which is the transmission mechanism for their policy. So give us, give, give us a feel for the, for the banking stock in, indices in, in Japan and in, uh, in, in Europe, given that, oh, I don't know, our president is calling for negative interest rates. So just focus us on what's happening, happened to the banking sector in those countries. So the Japanese bank stock index, the Topics bank stock index, mm -hmm. since 1989, when it hit, the Nikkei hit its peak, and the Topics did as well, is down 90% in nominal terms over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so you, we destroyed the equity Gosh. of the entire banking system. And now you're at the point in Japan where a lot, at least a lot of the regional banks are actually on, on, on the cusp of going out of business. If you're a big Japanese bank, like Mitsuo, Nomura, you have the opportunity to do some business overseas. Sure. So you can offset the, 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 the profitability pressures by having business in Japan. But if you're a regional bank in Japan, you really don't have anywhere to go. So they're literally dying. And then you look at Europe. Europe. And since 07, the uh, Euro stocks bank index is down 70%. And in particular, since June 2014, when Draghi went down the, the negative rate route, that index is down 40%. Now, they will say, at least in Europe, that, well, their, their volumes have gone up. Their loan volumes have gone up. And the analogy I Make like to give is- Make it up on volumes. Yeah, so in Pets.com in 1999, you know, kept selling more and more pet products, but because they were losing money on every product, they went out of business. So yeah, banks are, are trying to offset the compression on their margins by trying to increase the volume, but they're actually making less and less because the margins are falling faster than their loan growth is. So we know that that unconventional monetary policy was not born in the United States. In fact, uh, Bernanke gave a speech years ago in Japan where he suggested that, you know, perhaps if they wanted to generate inflation, they could just issue zero coupon um, bonds in, per in perpetuity with no maturity at all, which I think you call cash um, yes. at last check. But I think something happened because the Federal Reserve is the world's leading central bank uh, when Bernanke crossed that Rubicon. He brought together all of his closest advisors at the 2007 Jackson Hole. Um, it was there that the Bernanke Doctrine was born and that the precondition of 
zero interest rates, getting to the zero bound, was necessary before they could embark upon growing the Fed's balance sheet. Do we absolutely have to have, and we're finding out in real time, aren't we? But was it a necessary condition to go to the zero bound in order to launch unconventional monetary policy, whether you agree with QE or not? Was that a necessary condition? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think in, it, what the Fed did is they sort of turned the, the business of, of banking upside down by what they did to the yield curve. Because on paper, it was get short rates down to zero. And if that is not enough, then try to suppress long-term rates to encourage people to go out and lever up, whether mm -hmm. you're a business or a household. But what they did was they flattened the yield curve, which then damages your financial system and then leads to reduced profitability and limited growth. Yep. So I think Bernanke's mentality was, and his, his learning process was the Great Depression when Milton Friedman came out and said, well, it wasn't because it was not, not enough liquidity and it was all this deflation and they didn't, they didn't come to the rescue in the 1930s to save the day. And then Bernanke saw what happened in Japan, even though I think he misread Japan. Right. He thought that Japan didn't act fast enough and soon enough, rather than saying, well, maybe what they did was the wrong medicine anyway. So his idea was, I need to go big, I need to go fast. Mm -hmm. I need to get rates down to zero, and if that doesn't work, then we'll start to open up the printing press yep. to suppress longer term interest rates, because he knows, at least back then, obviously housing was depressed, and mortgage rates are gonna be priced off the 10 year. Well, how do I get that 10 year yield down? Well, let's buy as many 10 year treasuries as we can. Yep. Once Bernanke embarked upon unconventional monetary policy, QE. It seemed like it was some kind of a strange contagious disease. So now we have $22 trillion and growing. Now that the European Central Bank is back in the QE game, now that the Fed is in the not QE but still growing its balance sheet game, what do you think of the idea? Our, our mutual friend, Jim Bianco, made the comment, especially of 2017, when there was, what, $2.2 .2 trillion of global quantitative easing, the same year that the VIX was south of 10 in single digits 53 times, taking out the next closest year, which I think was in the 93 or something, when they had three days that the VIX was at, in, in a single digit type territory. What do you think of, of Jim's idea that QE is and has become global and fungible, that it knows no boundaries, knows no borders. Well, it's dead on. The, the, only, the only border, in a sense, is, is your currency. Because mm -hmm. every time you go from one border to another, you take that currency risk. But putting that currency at risk aside and assuming you can sort of account for that currency risk through any sort of hedging, yeah, it becomes borderless because it's that gets back to that old 05, 06, we call mm -hmm. that old, search for yield. Yep. So we have the big Japanese pension fund that is a huge holder of that three-letter uh, Those CLOs. We talked about. We're yeah. not going there yet. We're that, going there. So it, 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 it is because. But getting to my point of, of the simplistic thinking of a central banker is low rates are good and lower rates are even better. Mm -hmm. Well, if we can not just lower rates to zero, but we, somehow we can get that negative, well, then that's the greatest thing ever, because we want to get you to lever up. Right, of course. Yeah, there have been academic studies that have come out uh, that, that suggest that had we just gone to negative 5% here in the United States, that the pain of the great crisis would have been greatly mitigated. These studies, they even shave off one percentage point to account for balance sheet expansion, meaning I think a lot of the conventional wisdom among monetary policymakers today is that we can go deep into negative territory. I know you don't agree with that, and I know I don't agree with that, but talk to me, if you will, about Mario Draghi's legacy and what it implies for Christine Lagarde's future as head of the European Central Bank, because it would seem to me that if any bank is going to go way off the reservation when it comes to delving deeper into negative interest rates. 
that it's going to be the European Central Bank. Right. Tell us about Draghi's legacy and what Christine Lagarde faces. So Draghi took the lesson of Bernanke, mm -hmm. and then which also took the lesson of the Japanese. Like I think there, every, everyone looked at Japan and said that deflation is a boogeyman, and that the reason why Japan has suffered for all these years is because they have deflation. The problem with that analysis is that deflation was just a symptom. It wasn't a cause of their economic malaise. Mm -hmm. It was just a symptom. It was just consumers wanted to save more. The banking system and the, and, and the corporate sector needed to delever. The population stopped increasing. The aging population. And I mean, demographics matters, right. So, and actually, the average CPI rate over the past 30 years in Japan is actually around zero. So they've actually had price stability. So when you, when you misdiagnose the patient mm -hmm. and think that deflation is bad, well, then you do everything you can, obviously, to prevent that. And that was the mentality of Bernanke, and that was the mentality of Draghi. Mm -hmm. And Draghi drank that Kool-Aid of just get rates as low as possible and print all this money, and then poof, we're, I'm going to create inflation. And I like to give the natural, it's like a video game. You know, you got the joystick, you, you hit the right spots, and all of a sudden, you get the outcome that you, that you think. And, and that's how, I mean, when you think about trying to get a higher inflation rate just based on, on what you do on the monetary side, you know, things don't always work out that way. You don't know where the money goes. Mm -hmm. So Draghi, in a way, followed what the Swiss bank did. Sweden and Denmark also had gone negative right around the time when Draghi decided to take that path with the very simple mentality of if I scare money away from me as a central bank, it will then go out into the private sector right. and everything will be great. Magically create economic activity. Right, the problem with that is that negative rates is a tax that somebody has to eat. So if it's a bank that has money with me as the ECB, well, I'm taxing them, and how do they get that back? Well, then they actually raise the cost of financing to their customers. Mm -hmm. So soon after he went negative, we saw mortgage rates in some countries actually go up after he was going negative. Right. So now we're at the point where banks are saying enough is enough. Individuals are now gonna start eating this. And businesses are gonna start eating this, not through me embedding it in the cost of a loan, but just I'm gonna penalize you for just having deposits with me as a regular bank. I'm just gonna charge you. Right. So now you're getting into a really sort of um, uh, damaged part of, of, of this experiment where you're actually now taxing individuals. Well, this is gonna go at, beyond, at, at the, the, this is gonna go, go beyond the, the banking sector into the private sector at a time when European growth is flatlining. Right, and what no central banker really thought through, now any central banker, they're so good at getting into this policy. You know, this mm -hmm. is the asymmetry, but there's no thought about how to get out. So we're now at a point where Draghi has proven to be, and now Lagarde, they've trapped themselves. Mm -hmm. And they've created, in financial history, the greatest financial bubble in the history of the world in, in, in credit and sovereign fixed income and everything that yep. prices off that. So how do you get out of that? So just imagine the damage done just by going back to zero mm -hmm. from negative. Just, just, just that, just now there's, what, 11 trillion of negative yielding securities Imagine that goes to zero. The imagine the just t even, you only need a few basis points times eleven trillion, just the and losses. that equals a lot of money. Starting points matter, right? And then that filters through the entire yield curve, not only in Europe but Japan, and infects the U.S. And all of a sudden, you get this this rise. So, getting out of this is now proven to be impossible. Mm -hmm. So that gets to the Fed. You know, Jay Powell yep. has a choice. Do you learn the lessons from what went on over there? Mm -hmm. Do you learn the lessons from Bernanke's? experiment and Yellen where they got trapped at zero for seven years. And, and look, the Fed, the Fed is trapped with QE. It, it was so easy to get out of and now all of a sudden their balance sheet is almost back to where it was. Right, and I mean, you and I were both really excited the first time that Jay Powell testified to Congress. When he was, I mean, his, his first day in office, he had a, you know, a, a four digit decline in the Dow and said nothing. And then his first testimony to Congress, he was like, well, we don't, we don't have to backstop the stock market. And you know, I kind of founded the Jay Powell fan club, and, and you were right there with me because it sounded like he was rational. I mean, he made comments in 2012 that the Fed risked blowing a fixed income duration bubble across the full credit spectrum, if I'm getting the quote right, and that QE would become habit forming. And it seemed 
for a while after Powell took office that he was determined to get somewhere close to normalized interest rates. I think he had 3% in mind on the Fed funds rate. And, and he was also equally determined to make good on Bernanke's commitment to truly exit unconventional monetary policy by shrinking the balance sheet via quantitative tightening. Neither of those things happened. Why? So he, he, that 3% was really a magic number he desperately wanted to get mm-hmm. to because in his eyes, if he was able to get around 2% inflation, the real rate would be 1%. And while it's below where it was pre-crisis, it still was a positive real rate. Right. Because the, the, the poison in the financial system has been proven to be when you have negative real rates. So at least 3% was the goal, assuming the 2%. And then, of course, you throw in the tariff uh, and trade war. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, Powell is desperately trying to get there and throws in that December 2018 rate hike and everyone freaks out. And obviously, we know what, what happened since. Like but watching paint dry in his press conference. Right. And with respect to the balance sheet, you know, this is all new to everyone. No one knew at what point shrinking that balance sheet was going to break something mm-hmm. until something broke. Well, we were breaking countries, but that didn't really matter. Right. We, we Yes. So <laughs> th- things were beginning <laughs> so, to break in the sense that that contributed to the decline in the fourth quarter of last year because rate hikes and shrinking the balance sheet was a double form of tightening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're all winging it here. Mm-hmm. That's that's what this, this unconventional... By definition, unconventional is you're winging something. You're trying something you didn't try before. Right. And you're 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 in this dark room trying to feel where where the walls are. And now we're again seeing an instance where, you know, the, like the Godfather, like I tried to get, you know, I'm out, and then they pull me back in, and the Fed's getting pulled back in, just as Al Pacino said in Godfather, Godfather Three, because they're they're all now trapped. Yep. In in a policy where once the market feels like they don't have that that cushion and that backdrop, somehow they can't figure it out on, on its own. And I think we'll learn a lot more as time goes by, especially as year-end approaches and the window dressing at banks and year-end funding strains start to really kick in. Uh, I, I think we'll know more when we have the benefit of a rearview mirror. You know, I've, I've spoken with George Goncalves, in, interviewed him here on, on Real Vision, and uh, he, he really does a good job of, of, of explaining that, you know, foreign central banks are parking money at the Fed. Currency and circulation is increasing. So you add it all up and, and quantitative tightening ended up being twice its magnitude by virtue of other factors. But the Fed knew this was happening. I mean, this, this is money parked at the Fed. It wasn't like parked somewhere where they couldn't see it. They saw currency in circulation rising. And tack on top of that, they knew once the debt ceiling was resolved that the Treasury was going to have to refill its checking account at the Fed. So they also knew what Treasury, how, how much Treasury had depleted its own funding, and they knew that quarterly tax payments would be coming due. So these were all known knowns, to use Rumsfeld's term. What on earth went wrong? I, I think they underestimated what the response function was going to be from the dealer community. So you had the the bank primary dealers mm-hmm. that I think when you're when you're Jay Powell, you assume okay if there's if repo rates rise for whatever reason, then J P Morgan will say yeah I'll, I'll lend to you at two percent or three percent or ten percent. Sure, I'll, I'll you know every, we'll do that trade every day. I don't think they appreciated the regulatory constraints and how that handcuffed the primary dealer community. Right. Therefore, they didn't foresee the non-bank primary dealers, how they tried to step in, well, they don't have the balance sheet like Bank America and JP Morgan do. They have to go into the repo market to borrow to absorb that, that treasury supply. Mm-hmm. So I don't, that, that's, how I, that's how I think that this went on, is they, they really underestimated and didn't appreciate the handcuffs that have been put on the dealer community once you cross a certain level of s- treasury supply that all of a sudden couldn't be handled anymore. Mm-hmm. And then you, 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 know, you pile on top of that the John Williams effect. You've got a pure play academic who's 
presumably a, a brilliant monetary economist. Who doesn't have a quote machine, I don't think, in his office. Famously, no Bloomberg machine on, on his desk. Are the lights on but nobody's home at Liberty Street? I mean, that's kind of the sense you get. They, they have these extremely quiet announcements with somewhat regularity that they're going to be extending out. They just extended out two operations in November and December and another in, 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 in early December that's 28 days, 42. They're just, it feels like, are, is the Fed throwing spaghetti at the wall? They are, and they're doing everything they can, at least just to get through year end, by overdoing it, by over dousing you know, that fire that went out mm -hmm. on the hopes that at least through year end, we'll quell it, and then we can always pull it back in January, February, when some of these constraints get eased, which we have to see what happens. We don't know. Right. The problem the Fed now is creating is this, this dependency again, where is the Fed going to become the repo market? Is the Fed going to become this intermediary that they were never intended to do right. and to be because the market all of a sudden becomes addicted to them and can't function without them? And that's the danger that they now put themselves in going into next year. Right. Rather than saying, you know what, maybe we overdid it on the regulatory side. Now, they're sort of hamstrung there because of Basel III, and, and, and that, that's a whole regulatory discussion that needs to be had. And but, there's been major pushback by Powell at press conferences. He said no to right. easing the regulatory constraints. Exactly. So that's why they're trying to overdo it and overcompensate mm -hmm. on the monetary side. But again, like you said, January, February will be the real test to see whether this market can actually walk on its own mm -hmm. after being handheld for the, for the last couple of months and certainly into year end. So um, I have this working theory that Jay Powell's boogeyman is kind of this great big monstrous fixed income exchange traded fund lurking in the background. Uh, you know, a, a year ago, fixed income redemptions, fixed income ETF redemptions went up appreciably. We saw high yield spreads go up. The year end funding strains exacerbated this. I don't think that Powell's forgotten how this worked last winter. And I think that that it is one of the reasons maybe that he is actually delving into what he won't call QE. But, but on October the 11th, they announced that they were going to be growing the Fed's balance sheet by $60 billion a month. That's not too far off the $85 billion QE infinity rate when the Fed was you know, at its peak level. So now we're talking about a $1.6 trillion run rate on growing the Fed's balance sheet. 40% of quantitative tightening has vanished into thin air um, in, in the space of two months, what took them 21 months to put out there. He's afraid of something. And I think that it ha may have more to do with more, more than, than to do with bank balance sheets. So walk us through, if you will, what's happened in corporate credit in the United States as a result of this policy that we're all clearly market participants, corporations alike, addicted to. So I'm going to rewind back to pre-crisis, or actually through the crisis. Mm -hmm. If there is one area of credit that performed rather well, it was the CLO market. Mm -hmm. It was these, and, and, and for the average person, these are senior secured loans, as opposed to a junk bond, which is mostly unsecured, so is subordinated to a senior secured bond. Yep. So in the crisis, those senior secured bonds actually made it through relatively well. Now, the equity below that or the subordinated bond below that may not have, have, done, or have done well, but the senior side did. So people out of the crisis said, wow, this is an asset class. It's a real asset class. It survived the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. Therefore, this is really viable. And all of a sudden, this really small market became rather big. And if you're a company, and all of a sudden, you have this, on the demand side for yields, you have this, this, this crop of investors that want yield. And if you can sell them debt as opposed to equity, you won't dilute your shareholders. You're getting low-cost capital. Mm -hmm. So you think that it's beneficial to you. Sure. And if you can sell it senior secured, well, then you'll get an even lower interest rate. And if the Fed has rates at zero and I'm paying LIBOR plus and LIBOR is close to zero, I can pay LIBOR plus 300. And because LIBOR is so low, I can afford that. It's great. Sure. So 
all of a sudden, as the years went on, more and more, and then, and then you created a bigger CLO universe and all these, these, these entities that were created. So for every CLO that's created, that creates then new demand for these loans. And then Wall Street and companies see, okay, there's this huge demand from these loans from these CLOs. Let's feed them more loans to put into their CLOs. Nice, nice and, fees as well. And it just it's just back and forth, and mm -hmm. it's just a replay of of you know the the, the CDO market in the mid 2000s. Um, they kept just creating these new products. Right. I mean, what I think I think the 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 percentage of covenant light leverage loans in 2007 was somewhere in the 20 percentage. Range and remind me where did where are we today? So now you're north of 80, and some that you're actually having there, there, there's no protections. So here you have now the leverage loan market that's north of a trillion. Mm -hmm. You have the high yield market that is north of. But now you're into a situation where, regardless of of how much money somebody is going to lend you, you still at the end of the day have to make those payments. Mm -hmm. You still still need a growing economy in order to service your balance sheet. And now, all of a sudden, LIBOR, because the Fed fund rate is not at zero anymore, and even with the cuts, it's still, LIBOR is still north of two plus percent. So that LIBOR-based loan all of a sudden becomes more expensive. Yep. And if you had sold debt last year, you probably paid even more. So now, all of a sudden, the economy starts to slow. You go from a 3% GDP run rate, and all of a sudden, you're now at a 2%. Now, that is a one-third haircut in the rate of growth. And for many companies out there that have profit margins of, let's just say, 5 to 10%, all of a sudden you lose some of that business, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden your margins get tight, and that loan obligation that you have to pay quarterly to investors all of a sudden becomes a bigger nut that you have to absorb. So now all of a sudden, from an investor standpoint, well, rates are going down, so floating rate bonds aren't as attractive anymore. Right. So there's less demand now for this. Well, these companies need to refinance, or they're going to refinance into a situation where there's less demand. Credit quality is now deteriorating. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of now a growing percentage of the CLO market that are trading below 90 cents on the dollar because investors are beginning to sniff out slower economy, crimp on cash flows, difficulty in paying back that debt. Mm -hmm. And now it hasn't really shown up too much in the high yield market in the aggregate, but it's beginning to show up in the junkiest part of the high yield market, the triple C right. area of the market. So the triple C yield to worst in the Barclays index, the yield is back to where it was in January. Now we remember January was right after a pretty rough fourth quarter. The world was basically ending. Right. So when you look at the, the depths of credit, investors are becoming more discriminating in different credits or beginning to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And just like with Lyft and Uber and WeWork and all of Silicon Valley, private equity, VC-funded firms, everyone is now beginning to pay attention more to the balance sheet. Everyone is now beginning to pay more attention to cash flows. And even for investment-grade companies, you listen to corporate conference calls, and every CFO is telling you what their debt-to-EBITDA ratio is. And they're telling you what their debt-to-EBITDA ratio wants to be by the end of 2020. Because now, investors care. And one of the characteristics of the fourth quarter sell-off in the stock market last year was those companies with the highest debt to, to EBITDA ratios mm -hmm. got hit the hardest. Now, of course, Powell came and saved the day, right. and there's going to be a China trade deal any day now, and all of a sudden, those worries went out the door. But I do think, again, in that CLO, that triple C market, we're beginning to see the impact of, of, of a crimp on cash flows mm -hmm. and a more discriminating investor that's then going to then spill over into the Bs and the double Bs. So that's really the next thing to be watching. Yeah, and we've actually seen um, cash stores, it was, ca cash was almost at $2 trillion at one point, dominated, by the way, by the seven largest companies in the country. And we've seen that come down to about $1.5 trillion in fairly short order. Um, you know, I, I, I heard a report out of one of the big sell-side firms that said, as long as we have growing earnings per share, we're going to be fine. This is a high yield strategist. Mm -hmm. But if we were to see uh, earnings actually contract, then that would be highly problematic in terms of all our, our default rate outlook. And it's, it's convenient that very few now um, actually reference fact set data that's only been around since, what, September 1978, uh, because now fact set has gone negative for all of 20, 
19. Right. So it seems to me that that Jay Powell's got a growing challenge on his hand because mm-hmm. you, you you can fill in the blank. If you're Joe Q CFO and your investors are on conference calls telling you to pay attention to your balance sheet, what does that sort of preclude you from doing? Exactly. So you are obviously no longer buying back stock where you're doing it at a much reduced pace. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're focusing more on your capital expenditures right. and you're hiring. I mean, you, you can imagine that every VC in this country called every single one of their portfolio companies after what happened with the the IPOs and WeWork that, okay, guys and girls, it's time to focus on profits sooner rather than later. Yep. And the the hiring, let's put a timeout on that. And getting that and leasing that extra 30,000 square feet of space, well, let, let, let's work within our existing space. Right. Because that's, what, that's what's most important right now. And to the point on earnings is the problem right now with earnings is that not only are you seeing a slowdown in the pace of revenue growth, because mm-hmm. you know, theoretically, revenue growth, at least for the S&P 500, should be nominal GDP growth around the world. So right now, the IMF has GDP growth a share of 3%. Let's just tack on one and a half, two percent inflation. Let's call it five percent revenue growth. Mm-hmm. Now that's for if you're a multinational. Profit margins are now receding, mm-hmm. so you have the slowdown in revenue growth, and you actually have now profit margins which are contracting. So the earnings estimates for 2020 in the S&P are still like seven, eight percent. Oh yeah, they're up well, there. Well, that implies that you'll you'll get an acceleration of GDP growth, which maybe, maybe, maybe not, but that also improves a real big reversal in this decline in profit margins. And one of the key reasons why profit margins are receding is because labor costs are becoming a bigger portion of the expense pie. Sure. And let's just say the economy does get better. Well, with a labor market that's tight, we can assume that wages will pick up even further, will crimp profit margins even more. Right. Now, it'll be great for those employees that are getting those wage increases. But if companies then start to resort to layoffs or, or whatever reason to try to protect profit margins, that becomes a problem. So, and we have to look at the last 10 years. I mean, earnings did a V bottom. Earnings are up dramatically from 08, but revenues are barely higher. Mm-hmm. And there are a few things that really goosed profit margins. It was the cut in, in labor costs where the, the labor portion of the profit pie was the smallest since World War II. And that's a biggest. That's that, that's a company's biggest cost. Mm-hmm. You had obviously the stock buybacks, which I argue that last year was the peak. Now the company's focused more on, on balance sheet improvement. You also had a dramatic decline in interest rates, which goosed uh, or dramatically reduced interest expense, which helped profit margins. Well, interest rates are low, but you, from a delta standpoint, you're not going to get a big drop in interest rates right. to goose profit margins. So I think that that story is not going to be repeated. So it's the profit margin side that people have to pay attention to at the same time that revenue growth is slowing. Mm-hmm. And there's just, people are trained to think that there's always this, this V inflection higher in, in terms of growth because central bank easing lifts you higher. Right. But the problem right now is, is that the whole point of stimulus, when I, when I want to stimulate a behavior through monetary policy, it's just trying to convince you it's making a deal with the consumer and the business to say, if I lower your cost of funding today, will you buy the car today or the house today rather than spending the next two years saving up for it? Mm-hmm. So, But if rates are already low, that in- encouragement, that incentive is sort of more, it's more dull. It doesn't have that same impact because right. you're like, you know what? I don't need to rush. Rates are low. I'm just going to wait. That's, that's, that's why the forward guidance was a flawed policy. Because forward guidance actually slowed growth. Right. It gave people an excuse to wait. To wait, as right. opposed to encouraging them to act. And you still hear about forward guidance. Forward guidance, I think, is like an effective tool, and it's the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. So we're in a situation where monetary policy is no longer stimulative. Dot, dot, dot. Um, you know I love great central banker quotes. Just love them. So yeah. Janet Yellen saying that we will never have another financial crisis in our lifetimes. Um, Pure speculation, Peter. Nobody's going to hold you to this, I promise. Um, But why don't we end today by you telling me where, in your mind, systemic risk might be lurking in the system if there was to be some kind of uh, of a geopolitical event or a financial event, something that triggered a daisy chain. Where do you think kind of 
the weak point is in I, the global financial system. I, I think it would be an uncontrollable rise in longer term interest rates. Okay. That would start, whether it's in Japan, because now Kuroda wants longer, higher long-term interest rates, mm -hmm. or it's the ECB where they finally say, you know what, we got to get out of this negative rate environment because we're, we're, we're killing our banks. Mm -hmm. It is, Sweden's already gone there. Sweden is, 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 going is there. dead set on yeah. getting out of negative interest rates this December. So it is a, an uncontrollable rise in long-term interest rates that central bankers can, no, can not control is, in my opinion, the biggest threat because that's where the biggest bubble is. And if you get a pop in that bubble, that's to me the, the biggest worry. Now they'll do their, they can control the short end, no question. They'll pin that to zero or negative as much as they want. But as we saw in Italy last year, mm -hmm. where rates can rise uncontrollably in a very short period of time, irrespective of all that purchases, uh, all those purchases by the ECB, right. that to me is the biggest risk. Those CLOs on Japanese bank balance sheets would, would be in a world of pain. In, so you imagine you get a cost of in such an capital environment. increase in the sovereign, what it does to the whole corporate world. Absolutely. Um, Peter, thank you. Thank you so much for your time Thanks, today. Thanks, Danielle. It was great. Was great visiting.